Welcome to another episode of the Chronically Healing Podcast with Jesse Fritz and Christina Sangera. We are so, so happy to welcome you to yet another episode. We're grateful for you guys, our community who continues to support us. We love having your suggestions for what you want to hear about and the guests in the future. This episode, I know I say this pretty much every time <laughs> because we do have some pretty awesome guests, Yeah, but this one, I feel like we went deep on mm -hmm. things that I... I feel are just really, really important. What did you think? I, I feel like you took so much away from it for your own journey. I did. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting that level. And that was, that was su surprising in a good way. Yeah. So we talked with Elizabeth Kristoff and she is just like the smartest person. I swear she was, um, talking about her journey with what is it? It's applied neurology, right. And somatics and, um, like brain rewiring and all this stuff, nervous system regulation and dysregulation basically. And it's the stuff that I feel like we hear about a lot, but we're all like, what the heck and Bob does that mean? Right. And then for me, I have been like, so, dysregulated <laughs> for so long. And I've been kind of pretending like that's not true. I've been doing mm. the whole, like, there's no way that the reason I'm holding on to 60 pounds is because I have an emotion stuck inside of me. That's not a real thing. Right. Because it's easy to just like pretend. I feel like that's, that's part of nervous system dysregulation, right? My body's mm -hmm. trying to like, you're protect protecting yourself. From, right. So it was just so interesting what we talked about with Elizabeth today. And what were some of your favorite parts? Well, I, before I go into that, I want to say, so I'm on the other side of what you just said. So mm. I've been where you are. And it wasn't until I started doing the nervous system work that I had right. those breakthroughs. So I get what you're saying 100%. I used to, I used to feel really similar. And then I started to do the work. And I was like, holy crap, there's <laughs> something to this. Right. And the reason I knew that I was truly shifting is my husband of, gosh, we've been together almost 12 years. He's dealt with my anxious ass forever. <laughs> and he started to say, oh my gosh, I'm noticing you shifting. And then I started helping him and he's right. never really been anxious. And after lots of stress, he kind of moved into that. Anyway, it was just so affirming mm -hmm. to see that the nervous system work is such a big piece because, oh my gosh, I experienced so much from it. But I think part of me wondered, maybe it's just me, maybe it's, right. but I really think we could all benefit from nervous system work. I my biggest takeaways from this particular episode, one, I like how we broke down the jargon because mm -hmm. it, like you said, neural pathways, somatic healing, we talked about nervous system regulation, parasympathetic and sympathetic right. dominant sides of our nervous system. We hear these things a lot. They're becoming more mainstream, which I'm actually happy about. But what mm -hmm. inevitably happens when something becomes mainstream is it can kind of get lost in the jargon and right. then people don't really know Or people know what make that it is. into something that it's not. They're like, yeah, I'm a yes. somatic coach. And I'm like, yes. no, you're not. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yes. I'm in a mastermind right now and I have a course that I do. And I mentioned something about detox pathways. And she said, look, your audience doesn't, doesn't know what that is. They want to know what are the symptoms of having a de detox pathways that aren't working well. Right. And I thought, holy crap, she's right. My right. people don't know the jargon because they're not in this world, immersing themselves in it. That's my job. That's why I do what I do. Mm. So I like that we broke down the jargon so people mm. can fully understand what the heck everything means. And then I also like how we all shared our story. I felt right. that that level of vulnerability really connected us. Elizabeth mm -hmm. doesn't know this, but she's my new best friend. So <laughs> I'm going to make that happen somehow. But right, I really resonated with her and her energy. And vulnerability is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, as a coach, often struggle. I, I share a lot about myself for sure, but some of the deeper issues I struggle with because there's this feeling that you need to have it all figured out in order to be a coach. And really mm -hmm. it's, you just need to be a few steps ahead of the people that you're helping. You mm -hmm. don't, no one ever has it all figured out. Even mm -hmm. people who have done a lot of the work still have setbacks. And I like how we talked about that too. And then the third piece for me was binge, binge eating. Mm -hmm. That was huge because binge eating is such a spectrum. And I think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about what that actually is. So mm -hmm. I love that we actually broke that down, right? right? We talked about what it actually is. Right. And I, I'm not usually one for trigger warnings because I feel like we're all triggered by 
everything, but this is one I do want to put on. I know that some people really struggle with, um, eating disorders and disordered eating. We do go in depth into binge eating and other types of disordered eating. So if that is something that is going to trigger you in a way that you are not ready for skip to the next episode, Speaking of the and, nervous system, right? Yeah. Do protect yourself in, in that way and, and understand, you know, what, what you can and cannot listen to. But for me, um, I've struggled a lot with disordered eating patterns with binge eating and and it was just very interesting to hear your story, to hear Elizabeth's story. And then to just kind of feel like, oh, I'm not alone in this. And this is something that I think a lot of women deal with the disordered eating specific, specifically and, and how, how that connects with your nervous system and how your body is actually trying to protect itself. And it's, it's actually your body regulating itself. Right. And it was so interesting to hear about that, but I did just want to point that out because I know that that can be a really tough subject for some people. So good thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the theme of this episode to me was self-acceptance, self-love, grace, Mm -hmm. breaking down the jargon and making it actionable in your life and Mm -hmm. vulnerability. I think Mm -hmm. that anyone who's down for those things will be down for this episode. So I definitely hope people enjoy it. Now, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, she also gave us some like tangible things to do, which we always pull out, which is really important. But she like took Christina and I through like a a short little uh, demonstration practice exercise. And then she talked about a few other ones that you can do. She also has a free um, program that you can do that we'll have linked in the show notes that I think could be really helpful for people that are just like, what does this stuff mean? What is it? You know, it's not something that you have to be doing like breath work for 25 minutes a day. This can be, you know, like a, like a 30 second, you know, we did a tongue exercise. It was very interesting. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I like that. Actually, thank you for mentioning that. I do like, and we talked about this, a lot of people need a quick win to keep going deeper with the work. And I like that these exercises can provide that. So that's, that's a big piece for sure. Mm Mm-hmm. So all of that is fabulous. Before we get to the episode, I do just want to ask how you're doing this week. Mm -hmm. Love this question. And I'm always like, how am I doing this week? You know, it's, it's been, I feel like it's been a pretty good week. We're getting like cooler weather here, which is like very exciting. I am not a humidity girl and I don't know why I moved to the South thinking that it was not going to be any humidity, but it's kind of cooled down here. So we've been able to like get outside when you guys are listening to this, this will be a few a few weeks to a month in the future, but, um, we just got a puppy a few weeks ago. So there's like, you know, this whole puppy re or like introducing a puppy to our family. So that's been interesting for sleep and nervous system regulation (laughs) for sure. So it's been, it's been pretty good. I feel like I'm in a place this week where I'm trying to focus on good things about my body and what can I, what can I like about myself? I'm reading a book called the high five habit by Mel Robbins. Yeah. Are you loving it? I remember you said you were going to read it. Yeah. I really like it. It's, you know, a basic self-help book. So if you look past the, the basicness of it, the basic bitch self-help book, (laughs) right? uh, exactly. But I think it actually dives deeper though. It does. Yeah. And it's very easy to consume. Sometimes I like, I was just talking about this with Christina, but sometimes when things get like a little too sciencey quote unquote for me, I like blackout and I can't. (laughs) So I like it when it's a little bit more tangible or like there's examples of real life things happening and like how, you know, how this works for, for me. So that's been, um, really interesting and like thinking about the way that your brain thinks about stuff and, and yeah, so I've really been enjoying that book so far, but, but yeah, that's kind of my week. How's your week been? It's good. I slept well. Mm. Usually I don't sleep well with the full moon. It's no. just a oh, yeah. nightmare. And I was able to sleep well. So that made me feel good. And like my body is starting to not be ridiculous. Was that so, last night? Uh huh. Last night. Uh, th- I think I said in a prior. I think I said in a prior episode how the full moon tends to increase cortisol and decrease melatonin, which is the Mm. opposite of what we want for sleep. And then for those of us who, most of us, have some sort of parasite activity going on, parasites actually hatch in your belly during the full moon. So, and that's what drives up cortisol. It's really cute. (laughs) So, yeah, that was cool to be able to sleep well for that. And I, in general, oh my gosh, I've been doing this work with a gal named Jen Kennedy. She's, she's just fabulous. I'm doing, I did something called becoming the millionaire woman Mm. and it was just a really powerful experience for me. So 
this week has really been about stepping into feeling good mm. and that all the things that I want happen when I consistently vibrate at a higher level. So the right. woo-woo in me gets that. But then, for example, I would recite these affirmations every day and I would do this and do that. None of the doing matters if I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. And so I've been focusing on these moments of happiness throughout the day. I literally stuck my tongue out when the rain came down yesterday, the first <laughs> rain of the season, right? That giddy feeling. Mm -hmm. I have been looking at trees and just feeling that that beautiful, mesmerized, I can't believe nature's so beautiful. Just all these things that put me in a place of happiness. Jesse, I'm not kidding you. Three things in a row happened that were just kind of affirmation that what I'm doing is working. Because I all well, I always heard that you need to vibrate at a higher level. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So basically, <laughs> right. right? Like so, I've so, but I actually started putting into practice just feeling good, just mm -hmm. making my everyday goal to feel good, and then when I start to not feel good, get back to feeling good. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's I don't know. I'm just saying, it's just there's some shifts happening in a good way that we're taking a very long time, and I think that I had resistance because deep down I didn't believe number one but then mm -hmm. two I wasn't focusing on feeling good mm -hmm. half the day I was stuck in this weird spiral in my head so that's been fun I just focus on those small moments what's cool about having a kid is they pull that out in you a lot so she yeah. constantly mommy let's pretend like I have 10 tigers for pets <laughs> this morning I have 10 tigers and 10 snakes you know or we'll have dance parties and just things like that yeah. So that's actually a blessing is she reminds me to vibrate at a higher level as often as possible. So mm. anyway, that's me just hanging out in the woo-woo zone. Yeah, we love that zone. That's my favorite zone <laughs> to be in. <laughs> as I fondle my crystal. <laughs> yeah, I, as my, I have like all my crystals on my wall there. Um, but yeah, so we're so excited for you guys to hear today's episode with Elizabeth. I know you're all, you all are going to love it. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, make sure you like and review, or what am I trying to say? Give us a good review over on the podcast network, because it's super, super helpful for us to grow. And it's a great way to get us in the ears of other people with chronic illness or who are just on their healing journey in general and want to learn more. So make sure yes, that you do yes. that. Show us some love. And then our Facebook group. Did you mention that one? No. So, um, yeah. Do you want to mention it? That's yes. Facebook. Facebook group, Chronically Healing Community. You should be able mm -hmm. to just search for that on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We are in the process of reviving that group. We're going to start doing some live autoimmune chronicles. And we will turn those into mini-sodes. But you'll mm -hmm. get first access by being in the group. So definitely yeah. hop in there. And we're also going to start having some special guests and things that we were just brainstorming so definitely join in there for all the goodies in between episodes especially because we have episodes every other week mm -hmm. in between time we can converse in there and connect yeah and the one cool thing about that is that um you guys could ask questions if it if you're live so oh, um, whereas you yeah. can't do that on the podcast i want to mention that too so i think you've mentioned this before but i definitely bring a lot of the tactical science here's how mm -hmm. stuff works to the mix and so if you guys have specific questions on topics that we dive right. into that's what i do for a living and i'm happy to answer so thank you for mentioning that that's a wonderful time for them to come on and mm -hmm. anything that you're curious about when it comes to we have some topics we're gonna be talking about like histamine and mm -hmm. you know there's so many things that people hear about and they just need some clarity on how to overcome it or what it even means in the first place yeah and even like even just our own experiences with, you know, these things that we yeah. want to talk about too. I think, I think sometimes it's like, it's same with what I just said about the Mel Robbins book, right? Is that yeah. sometimes we want to learn the, like the super intricate science side of things mm -hmm. and to understand where it's coming from. But sometimes we also just want to hear how that affects other people like us or how yeah. other people have been through it. So I think that we, kind of uniquely can bring both of those sides between both of us um, and both of our shared experiences. So we're really excited for those. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So make sure that, like I said, you subscribe to the podcast, but without further ado, let's jump into Elizabeth's episode. Hi everyone. Welcome back to the chronically healing podcast. We're so excited to have you here today. And with us today, we have Elizabeth Kristoff. Thank you so much for joining the show. We're excited to chat with you today. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, we're super pumped. Um, both Christina and I are like nerding out about all this and we're excited <laughs> to learn more from you today. And I think our listeners will too. So before we get started on everything we're going to dive into, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your story? Yeah, so I am the founder of a virtual platform called Brain-Based Wellness. And how I arrived there at this platform that puts the nervous system at the center of everything, whether that's mindset or performance or behavior change is I've been a mover my whole life. I think without knowing it, I really used movement to regulate my own nervous system. I have a lot of trauma in my background, childhood trauma. And I think movement was always the way I found to heal myself without knowing I was healing myself. And so when I was 24, I started um, a Pilates and movement studio here in Austin, and that grew to a couple studios. And um, when we were developing our teacher training program and growing the business, we decided that we wanted to include applied neurology in that. I knew enough about movement science to understand at that time you don't have a tight hip flexor, you have a brain that doesn't mm -hmm. think it's safe to release your hip flexor. And until you do something to change that at the level of the operating system, which is your nervous system, it, mm -hmm. you can foam roll it all you want, you can stretch all you want, but it's always going to go back to the way that it was until your brain thinks it's safe. And so I knew that I started studying applied neurology um, at an institute called Z Health Performance in Arizona, and really fell in love with it. And for many years, I had that movement company for about 12 years and used applied neurology to move people out of pain, chronic pain, and to improve athletic performance. And then my own life hit a time where things really fell apart. I had to dissolve my partnership shares in the business. There was a tremendous amount of financial stress. I felt like I was losing my identity and mm -hmm. my community, everything that I related to as, as my sense of self. And the very same week that I dissolved my partnership shares in the business, my romantic partner at the time who I lived with was diagnosed with a very rare cancer around his heart. And I went into being a full-time caretaker for him. And it was scary. We never knew if things were going to be okay. It felt like the floor was always falling out from underneath us. And I started to experience some really severe outputs of my own nervous system. I've been a binge eater my whole life. My binge eating got really bad and really painful. I would get migraines, chronic pain, uh, extreme fatigue. Sometimes I would be so tired. I couldn't even make it to bed. I would just kind of black out in the hallway um, wow. There was lots of living in hospitals, not getting sleep. And I started to research really for him first what was happening because he also had complex PTSD and we were young. He was 39. We were both sober. We were healthy. Like, why was this happening? And after the cancer surgery, he developed autoimmune around his heart. I had autoimmune. I have celiac. And I started to try to understand what is happening? And I started also to recognize in myself before these severe outputs of my nervous system, the same signals that I saw in my pain clients before they had pain, before their muscles got tight, the same signs of nervous system dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And I started reading all of these books, like Waking the Tiger, The Body Keeps the Score, or Complex PTSD. And I, I was doing that for him, but I started to see myself in the books. I started to really think, oh my God, that's me. Those are my patterns. And I began to understand how my dysregulated nervous system that had been following me around since I was a child, staying in these dysregulated states, oscillating between hypervigilance, fight and flight, and then going into shutdown, freeze, hypoarousal. I, my whole life had just been spent cycling through those states of dysregulation. And that is when I began an, a long journey of healing for myself, working with different somatic practitioners, deepening my applied neurology practice, applying it to myself, becoming very curious about my own behavior. And then the pandemic came and I knew everyone was going to be facing a ton of stress, financial fear, concerns about health, constant change in the world. And that is when I decided that I needed to launch this virtual platform because people needed tools. They needed tools to regulate so that they wouldn't have to face those same severe outputs of a nervous system that's been under too much stress for too long. 
Oh, I relate to this so much. Uh, and mm-hmm. I know, Jesse, I feel like you probably do too. We're both just nodding along. <laughs> So for me, I think one of my biggest stressors was definitely with my chronic illness. But prior to that, I had a really stressful job in the banking industry for 13 years. And I was diagnosed around the time I was exiting that. Then I had a baby, which really threw everything off. So there's just been a lot of things that I feel like I never fully worked through. And for me, in a in a general sense, I also heard the word trauma, for example, but I never really understood what that means. And I always thought of trauma as one singular big event. Right. So this big thing happened and now I have some sort of PTSD versus those little T traumas that happen mm. e- even on a daily basis. Mm. And so that was a really big realization for me. And I'm curious because I feel like so, so many people here nowadays, I feel like it's becoming a buzzword, which I'm actually happy about. I I find that this does need to become mainstream, but they hear things like nervous system regulation or rewiring your brain. And that just feels really vague, right? What does that really mean? Can you help our listeners understand more about what that actually means and how that might be put into practice? Because I feel like that's the missing link for so many people, maybe not taking that step to heal is they just truly don't even know where to start. Yeah. So I think it's a really important point that you made that, you know, trauma is not the event. Trauma is our body's response to the event. Trauma is what happens inside of our body. It's our physiological state. And it can come from an acute incident. And that would be like regular PTSD, but it can also come from stress over time, chronically being dysregulated and then having your nervous system stay in that dysregulated state. And that can be little instances over time, constant change, constant stress that leads you into a state of dysregulation. So what is dysregulation, right? Again, like you said, that's a huge buzzword right now. And it's sometimes it's like, what does that even mean? (laughs) Well, there, you know, how, how do I regulate? What do I, how do I know if I'm regulated or not? And our nervous system has part of our nervous system is called our autonomic nervous system. And that's the things that just happen. You can think of that as automatic or the things that happen automatically without our conscious awareness, our heartbeat, our digestion, our respiration when it's unconscious, um, the internal state of our body that you're not thinking about controlling. And as part of your autonomic nervous system, you have two parts. You have your sympathetic and you have your parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight and flight. It's your arousal response. It's what prepares your body to take action. You want to be in more of a sympathetic state if you're going to work out. You want to be in more of a sympathetic state if you need to do something, if you need to be able to protect yourself or get out of a situation. But then you want to come down out of that state into more of a parasympathetic state, which is your rest and digest, your calm and respond. And that is where your blood comes back into your organs. You digest your food. You're able to experience pleasure then. Your heart rate slows down. And so we never actually want to stay in either one of those states full time. Your nervous system is meant to oscillate between the two. And we, what we do want to be able to do is modulate so that we don't stay stuck in either one. And we also don't want to go too high up or too low down into either Mm -hmm. one. So you kind of want to make those waves less intense and you want to be able to regulation is really coming down out of one state, moving back into the other, moving back up and, and knowing when having the appropriate response to the appropriate stimulus that's going on in your life, being in the right state for the task at hand. That stuff is, it's so interesting to me. I have to say like, so my husband has been really into like nervous system regulation, understanding all this stuff for a while. And I've kind of been like, I have no idea what you mean when you say that, but my, my story mimics yours in a few areas. So like I, I've had Hashimoto's autoimmune for, for years now over 10 years, but I feel like I was kind of fine, fine. Like I was, I could work out, I could like, you know, do things in my life. I could function pretty well, but I was still having some issues. And then my husband now husband and I, Um, had, he got really sick out of nowhere and we had no idea what was going on. And I all of a sudden became a caretaker and I both physically, financially, emotionally, and I wasn't ready for that. And to be honest, 
um, like selfishly, I had always been the one being taken care of. So I really wasn't ready for it. And then, you know, the finances, we almost called off our engagement. We almost broke up. We went through all this stuff and we've since then done a lot of couples therapy and stuff like that. But since then my health has just been off the wall. I gained 60 pounds. I have not been able to drop it. My, I used to work out all the time, can no longer do it without like feeling completely wiped out from it. And my health just went like crazy. And, you know, I've done all the diets have done all the things and none of them seem to work. And my husband has really been pushing this. Like, I think that this is like nervous system stuff. And, and for me, just to be honest, like I was like, it it cannot be an emotion that's stuck in my body. (laughs) Like I was, you know, I was like, I'm like, there's no way it can't be that it can't, that can't be like what's happening. But in the last year or so I've been like, okay, I can see these patterns, right. Of like where my body still feels like it needs to protect itself. And it's like kind of in this constant state of like, you know, fight (laughs) basically. So Mm -hmm. it's just so interesting to hear what you're talking about because it it connects so much, but I'm just wondering, sorry, that was a very long story, but I'm just wondering so much. Yeah. Like how, when you were in that spot, or if you're talking to someone like me or someone that's, you know, in this spot and is like, what the, like, where do you even start? What do you, what do you suggest or how did you do it? So I feel really lucky that I had the background that I had, that I'd been studying the nervous system for the past 12 years prior Mm -hmm. to going through that time. So I feel like I was gifted with this unique framework in which to look at his behavior, look at my own behavior and have this, it was like a veil lifted and I could see what was going Mm -hmm. on inside of myself and I could see what was going on inside of him, almost like at an electrical level. And what I know to be true, and I knew before that too, was that two really important facts about about the way the human body works is that our brain is wired for survival first. Our brain's primary job is to take in information, assimilate that information, integrate it, and then produce an output. And the the output is determined by one major question, safe or unsafe. And if your brain does not decide safe, it's going to generate a protective output. And that protective output can be anything that forces you to make your world smaller, to get less stimulus coming in and to keep you safe. So it could be a migraine, it could be pain. For me, it was often a binge because I push, I was trained as an athlete and I pushed through the pain a lot. You could give me nausea, you could give me fatigue, but if I had a big binge, I would force myself into regulating my nervous system, moving out of sympathetic response into rest and digest. It mm-hmm. would shut my body down. It would give it the stimulus that it needed to have that regulation. And I would, I would rest. And so a protective output can also be depression. A protective output can be anything that gets you to close everything down and, and stay smaller. I have chills right now. I just have to interrupt you because like everything, migraines, pain, depression, all of those things I feel on a, yeah. So keep going. Anyway, I just want to say I'm like, (laughs) yeah, absolutely. And it's really just your body and your brain doing the best that it can to do Mm -hmm. one of two things, either get the stimulus that it needs to stay healthy, active and alive because all parts of our brain need fuel and activation. And so if we're dissociated if parts of our system aren't getting enough stimulus, your brain is going to drive you to do things that give those areas of the brain a big boost of stimulus. So one of the things that gives a really important area of your brain, your insular cortex, which is part of an interceptive system that tells your brain what's going on inside of your body, a lot of stimulus is to eat a bunch of food or drink alcohol. And that will give stimulus to your celiac plexus. It'll get those nerves firing. It'll give your insular cortex stimulus. And now your brain's getting the stimulus that it needs. And it's, it's just found a way to do that. It's adaptive. And then the other thing is it will find a way to regulate itself, to bring you out of that chronic stress state. And like I said, binging for me was the way that it, it did that. It learned how to do that because our brains and our nervous systems have a deep intelligence and they understand that too much chronic stress for too long is dangerous. And it causes disease because you have these hormones, especially cortisol. It's like somebody flips the switch when you're under chronic stress and that cortisol is pumping out all of the time. Mm -hmm. Cortisol damages our blood vessels. Cortisol damages our nerves. 
and it dysregulates our nervous system. So it leads to inflammation and it wrecks our immune response. And over time that leads to disease. It leads to a disease state inside of our body. When people get organ transplants, they pump them full of stress hormones to suppress their immune system so that their body won't reject the organ. So oh, wow. what is happening to your immune system when your own body is pumping out those chemicals all the time, those hormones. And so our, our brain and our nervous system, just, they don't have our long-term goals in mind. They're like, this state has to stop right now. This isn't safe. And it will override your protective survival response will override anything that your cognitive mind wants in order to keep you safe and alive at that moment. So the reason I love everything that you just said is because we often hear that binge behavior is rooted in the food itself. It's the food that's really addictive, right? Oh, it's made to be addictive, which I do agree. The food that we have available to us is absolute crap and we have to work pretty hard to not, you know, go there. But on that deeper layer, the food is actually the second, that's not even the main reason that we're, we're participating in that behavior. And I think that is important because there's this guilt and shame spiral that happens every time a binge or a behavior occurs that you that we're trying to overcome. And we often look at the food. Okay, so if I just avoid this type of carbohydrate, then I won't binge anymore, right? And then we binge on it and we go, oh my gosh, okay, then it must be another food group. And really it's that survival mechanism that's playing on repeat in the background that we don't even recognize. And I think that's just really powerful. I wanted to draw that out a little bit for our listeners because I feel like so much of our thought process around binge behavior is a little bit opposite of what is actually going on. And if people knew that, there's a little bit of power in that. So, okay, now it's not just about the food. It's If it's about you, you can do a lot more with that than just worrying about being addicted to a substance. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I would argue it's not about the food at all. Mm, um, yeah. And I think diet culture is terrible. And as much as possible, I try to opt out of it. But I, what is important to understand, you asked me what I did first. And what I know that has to happen first for people is you have to create safety, safety inside of the body. And if you want people to stop engaging in a behavior, if you want to stop engaging in a behavior, then you have to have new tools for self-regulation. You can't expect yourself to take away the behavior if you don't have another way to regulate your nervous system. You need new tools to be able to do that. And looking at that through that lens of my body is just trying to keep me safe and alive. There really truly was a moment where I felt a profound sense of gratitude for having binged my whole life. I, like I said before, I have childhood trauma and there are other people that I know that have had similar amounts of childhood trauma and they got really sick. They didn't have food as a way to regulate themselves. They were either institutionalized or they got really sick. And there is a lot of research that links the higher your ACE score is, adverse childhood experience, the more likely you are to develop chronic disease because of that long-term state of, of nervous system dysregulation. And I used food all the time to re-regulate myself. And that was truly my body keeping me functional in the world, keeping me healthy. And also like, I, like I said, I could, I looked on the outside, like a very functional person, even though I had all of this trauma in the background. And so if I wanted to be able to move through that time of extreme stress, and I wanted to be able to change my behavior, I had to learn how to work with my nervous system and give it the stimulus that it needed and the tools that it needed to first create safety, create safety inside of my own body and safety inside of my environment. And then all the other healing could occur. Then I could look at the, what are the subconscious narratives that are trying to keep me safe with my food behavior? What are the emotions that I'm scared of processing through my body of feeling and experiencing that I'm binging to stop experiencing or to stay safe from experiencing? But first it's just use, use practical tools to create safety in the body. Are there a few examples of tools that you recommend someone might start with? I, I know that a program is wonderful, but for some people, they just need that quick little win to feel like, okay, I can do this. What are one or two things that you might suggest to someone who needs that quick win, that little, 
dose of confidence to then go deeper into nervous system work. Totally. So let me, I'll walk you guys through one or two drills and you can see how it works. And then I also just want to say on my website, which is brainbased wellness.com. There's a free video series that people awesome. can do. That'll teach them like five or six neuro exercises cool. where they can watch me do it. And they can also learn how to assess and reassess their nervous system. And it's a great way to just get started, see how it feels in your body. And I really want those tools to just be available to people so they can go there and get that totally free. Um, but let me walk, walk you guys through this as well. So one of the really important things about nervous system training is you always want to assess and reassess because everybody's nervous system is different. We all have different deficits in our nervous system. We all have different compensations. We need different stimulus. And so you want to find out if the exercise, the neuro exercise is right for you and change at the level of the nervous system is instantaneous. So you can always tell is this, is this particular neuro drill moving me in a positive direction or is it too much stimulus for my nervous system and it's forcing me into protective mode. And if so for today, let's just say that's not your drill. Then this is not something you want to do. There are ways to change it, but for today, let's just table it. And a couple of ways to assess and reassess are one is to just take an internal gauge. There are signs of threat that you can look for. Is your mouth drying up? Because when we're moving into our fight and flight response, we get dry in our mouth. When we're moving into rest and digest, you get more saliva in your mouth because that's part of your digestive process. So is my mouth drying up? If so, that's a negative response. Do I get more saliva? If so, that's a positive response. Do my shoulders start to rise up? That's part of startle reflex, a protective mm -hmm. response. So if I'm starting to feel tension in my shoulders and my neck, that means there's something threatening about this drill. If I feel relaxed, then that's a positive sign. And this is something that my body likes. And then you can also test a range of motion. So you could just turn your head from side to side and see how far you can see out of the corner of your eye and just assess on maybe a scale of one to 10, how much tension is in your neck. So there's a couple ways you can just get a baseline. And then a very simple drill is to just sit up nice and tall, relax your shoulders. And we're just going to do some tongue movement. Our vagus nerve innervates at the back of the tongue. And it's a really important cranial nerve in your parasympathetic, your common respond system. And so we're going to take our tongue and take it over your teeth, but under your lips, keep your mouth closed and just make some big tongue circles and try to go a little bit further back with your tongue each time. Keep lengthening your spine, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your nose and make your exhalation twice as long as your inhalation, starting to slow the breath down and then take the tongue and circle it in the other direction and continue to slow the respiration down, especially the exhalation. And then pause, relax, take one breath, take an exhale, and then just reassess. How does my body feel? Do I have more or less tension? Do I feel calmer? Do I have more saliva in my mouth? Do I have greater range of motion through my neck? And that would just be a really practical, easy to do drill to in the moment of stress, start to calm your nervous system down to start to work directly with your nervous system. I love this. Is this something that you do proactively or something that you do reactively? So I could see this working really well, for example, if someone's having a panic attack, right? Bring mm -hmm. them away from that feeling of basically being out of body. But also, do you recommend that people do these sorts of drills proactively? So maybe morning, noon, and night, or just as part of their daily ritual? So there's two ways that we train the nervous system on site. And one is we just find tools for regulation, like that tongue circle that gives your, your parasympathetic system, it upregulates it, helps you calm down. And those are usually drills that are really high payoff for people. They make them feel really good. And I would say, use that whenever you need it, whenever you start to feel signs of threat. So another really important thing about this is you want to start listening to this more subtle signals that your body is giving you because our body is always talking to us and it speaks more quietly in the beginning. And if you don't stop and do something, it's going to get louder and louder until you find 
find yourself in a binge, until you're in a migraine, until you're experiencing really severe pain. And so if you can stop and interrupt that protective response before you get so dysregulated, that's really important because whatever we do, we get better at that pathway becomes more well-worn. So when you ask about rewiring, that's what that is, right? Every time you move into a binge, every time you move into a migraine, you're getting better and better at moving into that response because that pathway is getting more well-worn. Every time you interrupt it, you're getting better at not moving into that response. And so if you can start to hear the quieter signals from your body and give it the regulation that it needs before you're so far gone, then you can start to change the response over time. So for me, it was, I would get a little bit of pain in my left knee. It was the site of an old injury. So that pain was a protective response, a well-worn path. I would get tension in the right side of my jaw. I would start to get tension around my eyes, like a migraine was coming on. My mouth would dry out a little bit. I would get heavy, fatigued feeling. And when I started to feel those signals, I knew if I keep pushing, I'm going to end up sitting on the kitchen floor, eating like a fistful of cake because I'm going to be, I'm going to need regulation so bad. And so if I could stop and interrupt that in real time, curb the stress, give my nervous system what it needs, then I could start to change the behavior. The other thing that we do is we actively train the deficits of our own nervous system. So we work on training the different input systems, your eyes, your visual system, your vestibular system, which is the balance system inside of your inner ear, your body mapping system, your proprioceptive system, and your interoceptive system, which is the system that gives signals from inside of your body up to your brain. It tells your brain what's going on inside of your body. All of those systems give information to our brain on a second by second basis. And remember, our brain's primary job is to make predictions, generate an output and keep us alive. So if the quality of the information coming in from those systems is better, then our brain and our nervous system feel better on a second by second basis. And you can handle more stress from the outside world, more stress from your life, because you don't have that constant low grade stress of those deficits in the input systems coming in all the time. So now you have more bandwidth to tolerate stress in your life without moving into a protective response. So for those, those, that deficit training, we we do that every day, every morning, every day before you work out or before you have a, you know, when you have time in the day, it doesn't take more than five minutes, but you do it on a regular, consistent basis to start to heal those deficits. And then the other ones are drills that you just keep in your back pocket for times of stress. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting what you're talking about too, with migraines. I've had migraines on and off since like the second grade and I'm 33 now. So yeah, you, you do have, the math. You I'm have not... a lot of headaches, Jesse. I feel like this is so good for you. I, yeah. I keep thinking of like, oh my God, she's probably so happy hearing all of these things <laughs> because I feel for you. Yeah. Yeah. And they've definitely, um, kind of spiked back up recently. And it's interesting what you're saying, because I, I can definitely tell like, you know, my neck and my back will get really, really tight. And I can feel like it, they start now as tension headaches, whereas they didn't used to start that way. So it's just interesting to think about it from, from that way, because my husband, which I will say, sometimes I think it's easier for people in our lives to like, see something that's consistently a pattern than it is for ourselves. Right. And my husband Mm -hmm. is like, I feel like the last three migraines you've gotten we have had like a disagreement in the morning. And he's like, I wonder if there's like some sort of tension build up there. So what you're talking about is really interesting. If like in that moment, after that argument or whatever, I can kind of check where I'm at because my migraine is kind of coming on as like to protect me. Right. It's also a space for like, I know if I get a migraine, my husband will take care of me and he'll be nice to me. So if there's like an irritation there, so, so yeah, it's just so interesting to think about because I can see this playing out in, in my life for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I have a a ton of clients that have struggled with um, migraine for a long time. And I will tell you that a lot of them haven't had a migraine in years now um, since doing this work and regulating their nervous system. And and me too, I I struggled with a lot of migraines. And what I noticed too, is that uh, 
it is a protective response. Uh, vision training really helps training the visual system. It's very important in terms of our brain's sense of safety. So I do a lot of vision training, um, but also to every time I try to up level my life. Every time I'm visible, like doing something like this podcast, or also like, you know, I'm in a partnership now and I'm, it's, it, there's a high level of intimacy and vulnerability, emotional vulnerability. And I want that. I want to move into it. But sometimes after pushing myself into that, I come home and I'm tired. I start to get a migraine. I want to binge. All these protective outputs come back as, as those deep, deep triggers happen, right? When I'm putting myself out there. And so what I have to do is in, in real time, regulate myself around that as someone who grew up in an unstable environment, I learned that visibility is scary. I, people are unpredictable. If you put yourself and you make yourself visible, you might get really hurt. And also we're social animals and we fear putting ourselves out there and being rejected from the herd. So now I have this business, I have this mission and vision, and I want to go out and put it out into the world. And I, in my cognitive brain, believe that visibility is an act of service. Visibility protects me. My visibility serves the world. But I would do something like be on this podcast and then afterwards I would get shut down with a migraine or a binge. So what I have to do is before I do this, I do some drills to regulate myself. And then after I do this, I do some somatics and some more drills to process that stress through my body and to re-regulate my nervous system because I do want to do this, but I don't want to sacrifice my health and the quality of my life. And I don't want to spend the rest of the weekend in bed after doing this. So I just take the time to, to re-regulate so that I can. Mm -hmm. Can you quickly explain what somatics is too? I feel like that's another, another thing that I've heard a ton about and it's, um, there's more and more people talking about it, but just in case people don't know what it is. Yeah. So somatic really just means like of the body, bringing the body into your healing work. And there's a lot of different somatic processes you can do. But the idea behind somatics is that everything we experience in our mind, we also experience in our body and all of that trauma and stress and everything gets stuck in the body. If we don't know how to release it, we have these patterns of, of movement and trauma that get stuck in our body and those responses get triggered in certain situations. And then we experience a, a trauma reaction and inappropriate response to a situation that maybe isn't life-threatening, but it feels like it inside of our body. And so somatics is trying to find ways to release that stress, that tension, those emotions stuck inside the body that we are carrying around at the level of our body and our nervous system, not just our cognitive mind. So somatics is the how it's, it's like the, the method, if you will. That's right. That's right. So it can be movement. Like I do a lot of somatic map flows where we move our body in like different, different novel movements and different patterns to try to release some of the held tension and the trauma stored there. I also practice EFT tapping, which taps on different acupressure points and kind of talks directly to the nervous system, calming your nervous system and allowing your body to release some of the emotional charge of whatever it is that you're talking about or dealing with as you're doing it. I want to actually give EFT tapping a little shout out prior to, so I have sleep apnea and I was waking up in the middle of the night, <gasps> gasping, telltale sign. I didn't know at the time. Heartbeat was 170 beats a minute, just sitting there drenched in sweat. I had to call 911 countless times. And every time they told mm -hmm. me I was just having a panic attack and I'm like, okay, I've had lots of panic attacks and this ain't it. <laughs> There's something else going on. And I would sometimes be so low in oxygen that I would start breathing fire. It, felt, it was so scary. I, I have trauma sometimes walking up my driveway mm. because I remember str running down the driveway at, in the wee hours, running toward the fire truck as it approached our house. It, it, it was just such a terrible time in my life. So I am being treated now for sleep apnea. I have zero of those episodes. I actually want to figure out why I have it, of course, but until then I need to be able to sleep without choking to death. But I want to say that what I, 
started to do when I started learning more about the nervous system is EFT tapping when these moments would occur, because there's nothing worse than feeling like you're literally going to die. That's what a, mm-hmm. that's what even with sleep apnea, when you wake up to those low oxygen saturation numbers, that's what it feels like. And I could not get my heart rate to come down just with the basic deep breathing type things in those moments. But EFT tapping completely started to bring it down. And I would say some mantras at the same time. So I just wanted to give a shout out. That's a really powerful exercise. And it especially helped me. I kind of feel like mine was a hybrid of low oxygen sat and probably panic attack because my body was like, hey, don't die. I'm going to give you a bunch (laughs) of adrenaline, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. In those situations, I would definitely recommend some drills to regulate your nervous system. And then EFT tapping is a great way, like you said, to release the stress, to release the emotional charge. And we do that a lot in our, in my food freedom program, because once we create safety in the body through applied neurology, then there's all of these deep subconscious narratives that are keeping you keeping you in your disordered eating because it doesn't feel safe to stop, right? Maybe you had a lot of body boundary violations and it feels safer to hold on to extra weight, to not get attention, to stay hidden. Maybe you fear social rejection from part of your herd, from your family, from your friends. If you opt out of diet culture and, and stop engaging in those behaviors, and that's a very strong, powerful force. There's a lot of different subconscious blockers that keep us from food freedom. And in order to heal that maybe it's just the emotions that we're afraid of experiencing, right? So we need the food to be a distraction from allowing that grief or that anger or whatever it is that we've internalized for a long time to come up. And so we use both applied neurology, but also EFT tapping to to go back and, and look at those those fragments of ourself that are unhealed, that are holding those old emotions or that are keeping those narratives alive and process that through the body and release it so that we can bring it into the light of consciousness in a way that we feel safe doing so. And we don't dysregulate our nervous system while we're doing it. Mm-hmm. And and can we also talk too about how I feel that binge, some people think of it as someone eating their entire fridge because that's the typical right. binge, right? Oh, I went in and I ate 20 bags of chips and just completely where you start vomiting. I think there's a spectrum for binging where oh, maybe absolutely. it's, right, it doesn't necessarily have to be so extreme that you're on the toilet. I think oftentimes it's not. For me, binging is having a whole bag of chips in one sitting and then feeling mm-hmm. like crap after, you right. know what I mean? And I think that maybe when people hear the word binge, it's important to note that I think a lot of us struggle in some way with that behavior. And mm-hmm. and it's- Especially it, as women. Especially <laughs> as women, especially when, yeah. it's funny you mentioned about emotions. I know that, especially for me, I, I own a brick and mortar fitness studio in addition to my coaching practice. And so the studio got hit hard during COVID. Yeah. I mean, oh mm-hmm. my gosh, talk about, it just broke me wide open. The mm-hmm. the scarcity that I had to work through. I had a scarcity mindset already. And then all of my fear was started coming true. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to learn, <laughs> but I'm also trying not to die from stress, <laughs> you know? And I have sh- been there, my <laughs> Right? Like, yeah. Shut down, not shut down. And then, you know, trying to please everyone. That's been the hardest part is trying to please everyone. I try to remain a safe space for everyone. I don't want it to be a place where anyone feels like they don't belong. So that's been a lot. I'm an empath. So yeah, I I found myself retreating back into these binge type behaviors, going and getting the thing that I know is going to make me feel like crap. And then afterward, that shame and that guilt spiral. But it's not that typical binge where, again, I'm on the toilet after necessarily, right? And I think once I realized that that was what I was doing, I love that we're having this conversation because I now do realize, and especially even with this conversation, that those behaviors are so, so much deeper than that food, man. I I have so much trauma, I think, even just from the COVID stress that I haven't worked through that I need to work through for sure. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, binging can be anything or we'll just say like disordered eating where I'm using food to regulate myself, to you know, I'm not conscious and I'm using it to block something out that I don't want to deal with. I'm not eating for fuel and I'm not eating for pleasure. I'm eating for some other reason. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's out of alignment with what I, what I really want and what is really good for me. Right. And so, um, I think 
that there's there's it's such a layered and and complex issue and and then we can it's also the the mental space that that occupies the obsession um the self abuse the inner critic and the the shame that you were talking about that comes with it and then the constant like duh, 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 what am i going to eat next when am i going to eat am i going to be able to do this am i going to stop the store am i going to not stop the store am i going to do this other thing should i bake this and you know it just goes on and on and on and how much of my headspace used to be given to my eating and now i don't think about that anymore i just mm. eat when i'm hungry and i stop when i'm full and because i don't have to I don't have to trigger those neural loops anymore with the binge. And I, I don't have to move into the scarcity and the deprivation that then inevitably sets me up for the next binge later. Mm -hmm. True food freedom. <laughs> it's like yeah. something, you know, as, cause I definitely struggle with disordered eating, um, and binging things like that. And it's, it's like one of those things that, you know, when people talk about like intuitive eating or food freedom, I'm just like, it's never going to happen for me. Right. But I, I believe now that it will, but like for a while I was just like, you know, I would yo-yo, right. I was so used to being like, I was tracking macros. I was eating like super, super, or people with chronic illness listening to this too, like having to be on super, super strict diets for, you know, Christina has been on the histamine diet. I've been on, um, low FODMAP and like AIP and these very strict diets. And then I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Food freedom, but food freedom to me meant and now I'm going to go eat all those things that I haven't been able to eat for the last few years, no matter how terrible it makes me feel. So it's like, there's such a, a balance with that. And it's, it's cool to hear that, you know, it's obviously something that can happen for people. It's I, I mean, I relate to that so much because I, I did make a choice at some point in my life, you know, being in the fitness industry and movement industry for a long time, I was really abusive to my body, really overtrained and, um, did not, I did not treat myself with a lot of kindness. And I made a decision at some point, like I'm opting out of this. I'm opting out of diet culture. I'm not going to abuse myself anymore. I'm going to practice intuitive eating. And I was still binging all the time. And it was really painful and really frustrating because it's easier said than done. But if you're trying to take away a tool that someone is using to protect themselves, a part of their identity, um, right. something that may possible to protect yourself from certain emotions and certain experiences and to regulate your nervous system. You can't just stop that and say, I'm just going to be free of this. I'm going to eat intuitively. And it's eating intuitively and moving intuitively is all a beautiful idea and it's worth striving for, but people need tools to be able to do that. It's, it's asking too much otherwise, I think. I totally agree with that. And I feel like a lot of people also struggle to just get started so not just with my wellness coaching clients but with my personal training clients too their biggest struggle is getting started and then once they get started they're only valuable in their eyes if they're doing well if they're acing 100 percent and they're getting that gold star and i find that just that momentum is hard for them to maintain because they also have this idea that they have to perform in every aspect and they're not necessarily looking at it as growth they're looking at it as performance right how can i get the highest score so and i i always say that i think a big piece of this is hustle culture i think a lot of hustle culture tells us that we need to perform and we need to ace the test so even with nervous system work for example i got stuck in the trap of i want to be perfect at my nervous system work oh shoot i missed my 12 o'clock nervous system thing i guess my nervous system's going to be in balance for dinner and i i started to really not enjoy it or it started to feel like something i was just checking off so i actually am curious i want to segue into a little bit of hustle culture because i have major beef with it and i feel like you'll have some good thoughts on it because it's it's impossible to avoid right mm -hmm. and somehow we're supposed to navigate doing this nervous system work really growing versus just acing the test but how do we do that in a culture that pulls us in so many directions and wants to somehow have us connected in 20 different places on a daily basis. We go on social media and we forget that there's an energy exchange. That's the equivalent of being around 20, 30, 40 people in a day. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're taking in their opinions and their thoughts and their beliefs. That's a lot. And yet we're wondering why we're exhausted. Do you have some good, let's call them boundaries, around hustle culture in the interest of preserving your nervous system and being able to still do the work? 
Yeah. There's so, so many good points that you just brought up then. So one of the things that I think is really important in just nervous system work in healing in general is this idea of minimum effective dose. Everything is like medicine. And if you had a headache, you wouldn't take just a tiny sliver of Tylenol because it wouldn't be enough stimulus to affect change, but you also wouldn't take the whole bottle because you might die. And so when it comes to the healing work, there's a bell curve, right? And it's the same with exercise. It's the same with movement, but it's also with our healing work. And so am I pushing, am I exceeding that minimum effective dose and moving myself into negative returns, moving myself into more stress, moving myself into more pain. And I, so I, I really try to start people with a very, very small amount and then gradually, gradually add on to that. So three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the morning, that's it. And if you miss a morning, who cares? Like, who cares? And so I think that's, that's really important. And then to really try to cultivate a mindset of curiosity rather than judgment when it comes to your behavior so that you can just look at it and be like, okay, I did this thing. I didn't do my morning practice. I binged. I, um, decided to numb out for two hours when I really didn't want to why? Because my body and my brain are always trying to protect me. And there's a reason why. And so if I can sit with that and ask my body, like, what did you need? Um, what ask my soul, like, what did you need then? And why did that protective output happen? Then that's a lot more productive for me than, than spiraling into shame. Mm -hmm. And then hustle culture. I, I honestly believe as you were talking, I, I was just thinking this, I think our our entire society is really dysregulated. Uh, we live in a culture that um, there's so much that dysregulates us. We're, we're very sedentary and our bodies are made for movement. Movement is a big part of nervous system regulation and brain health. We don't train our visual system enough. We're always looking at an object that is about 13 inches away from our face, a computer screen. And so our eyes aren't getting the stimulus that they need. We have a lot of disconnection and loneliness and not enough opportunities to co-regulate um, our food and, and all of that, right? All of that is dysregulating us all the time. And then we have collectively, I believe, a great deal of unprocessed stress and trauma. Mm. And perfectionism is a trauma response. Perfectionism is a way to try to control your environment so that you stay safe in an unstable environment. And if collectively we are all so dysregulated and we have all of this unprocessed trauma and stress, I, I really think hustle culture is an output of collective trauma and collective dysregulation. Mm -hmm. Preach perfectionism. I remember being in like interviews and you know, the quintessential, like, what is your biggest weakness? And people would be like, Oh, I'm just a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, And mm -hmm. it was like something, you know, that people, I mean, even for me, like I struggle with, I kind of am interested in Enneagram, not super, super into it, but like, I'm an achiever. I'm a generator in human design. Like I'm very like, you know, organized and I do things and I want to do them perfectly, but I mean, I got to like my mid twenties and I was like, shit, I am exhausted all the time. <laughs> like I feel, feel terrible all the time. And, and I totally see that for so many people. And it's such a like good thing, right? I'm saying this with air quotes for people listening. Like it's a good thing to be a perfectionist. It's a good thing to be like always on for your job and always available and all these things. And it's, um, it's just like, it's killing us truly. Right. It's making us very sick. A lot mm -hmm. of our society is very sick with autoimmune, with cancer, with there's so much chronic illness and, you know, our bodies are they're They're speaking to us collectively, too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And we're living longer. But is it worth it if you're feeling like crap? Like, I don't want to get to the finish line and, and stumble over it and collapse. <laughs> That's really not my goal. Right. I want to sprint there and run through the ribbon. And I, I wonder if sometimes we don't stop to also, and this is systemic, but I'm just going to say that I am so anti 40 hour work week, eight hours a day, only having what, two, I think I earned three weeks of vacation when I had been at the company for 10 years. Right. I had two weeks prior to that. It just, you know, the way that we reverse, we, we have our, our priorities backwards, you know, mm -hmm. 
And it's funny on my own healing journey, which is why I integrate it so much with clients now. So your interview, by the way, I just have to tell you, just want to like show you how much I appreciate it is really affirming that I went in the right direction because I kind of, I got away from some of the more tactical stuff because I realized that that won't work long-term. It might work short-term, but no amount of macros or programming or anything will work long-term if we're not addressing the nervous system and hustle culture and our disconnect from nature. So that was just such a big revelation for me. And it it has me wanting to just go overturn everything. But (laughs) I mean, who has the energy for that, right? (laughs) (laughs) I'm into that too. And I really believe that's a big reason why I want to heal and why I want to help other people heal is because it's, it's going to be a big task for us to overthrow this, you know, and it's scary. It's, we have to put, we have to really practice boundaries and that's very scary, especially if you, um, grew up in a codependent relationship, if you grew up in, in a dysregulated family system dynamic, then boundary setting is very difficult, very threatening at a physiological level. And so in order to be able to do that, I have to heal, I have to process my emotions, and I have to regulate my nervous system. And I really think this is a unique moment in time where we are being called to make some major changes in institutional structures, in the nature of our society, in, in the way that our society is racist and Mm. um, oppresses certain people. I think that in order to make those changes, we all have to do the work of healing and emotional processing and and regulation so that, so that we can, so that we can show up and do it. I'm imagining us linking up in Viking armor (laughs) and just running into battle. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Totally. And the, the, the prep for the battle starts at our internal state inside, right? So that we can be resilient. Doing our exercises beforehand Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. going into battle. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So one of our absolute favorite questions to ask people is to kind of dig into like what works best for you. So I'm interested in what are some of the things that you like to do every day that keep you feeling your best? Well, I have a practice of regulating my nervous system and training the deficits in the morning and before I work out. Mm -hmm. Movement has also always been a huge part of my life. So I I move and I I get out in nature every day. And that's Mm -hmm. really, really important to me. I swim, I hike. Love I'm that. a fellow nature junkie. We had a guest on who we dove pretty deep into nature, actually. Mm-hmm. And that was another piece of my healing journey, which we know also regulates the nervous system. Mm-hmm. Even just now, I just now put on my Instagram, let's let's normalize being outside even when it's raining. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people retreat indoors when it's raining. And what I actually did is I created a lounge area on our patio and so mm-hmm. i have a couch setting and a table and then we even have our dining table outside now so all of our mm-hmm. meals are outside even when it's raining and just that sound was so soothing just before this interview mm-hmm. right i was able to get into this deeper state of calm and i don't know there's just something and i feel like you don't really feel it until you go try the mm-hmm. right go put your feet on the ground go get in the sun more often i had a client who was feeling sick And I said, I want you to go put your feet on the earth for 20 minutes, ideally grass or dirt. And then I want you to be in direct sunlight without sunscreen during that time. And I know that's advice that pretty much no coach is probably giving. They probably would say, (laughs) I want you to drink ginger tea and do whatever. I'm like, no, I want you to go sit with your bear. And she's like, what? I said, go do it. She messages me an hour later, I feel so much better. (laughs) Yeah, you do, because you went back to basics. You lowered your inflammation. The sun in itself is so healing when you practice Mm -hmm. safe sun exposure. There's so many benefits and it's hard to put it into words. So I always like to get people, I say, just listen, okay? Just try it first, (laughs) you know, before you (laughs) discount the basics that are in your freaking backyard. Mm -hmm. 100%. Nature is healing nature's medicine yeah right 
Well, this has been so, so fun. I feel like we dove in deeper than I thought we would, which is wonderful. And we want to ask, what are some ways that people can work with you on this path? I know that we talked about the binge behavior and whatnot, but you you go much deeper than that too with the nervous system work. So where can people find you? And maybe you can even give us a quick overview of what are your main programs? Yeah. So the best place to find me is on my website, which is brainbased-wellness.com. And that's a membership site where we show up every day. I'm live on there and we train our nervous systems and we move in community Mm -hmm. together. And so you, we, I practice applied neurology. I do somatic practices on there. I do what I call a neurosomatic reset, which is very gentle nervous system stimulus and some neurosomatic meditation. And that happens on the daily. And you can also access that free video series there, which is a great way Mm -hmm. to just, again, feel it, experience it, see if it's maybe the right fit for you. And so the membership site is there. And then I also do small group coaching programs, um, food freedom and energy creation. So energy creation is for my burnt out entrepreneurs who are experiencing a lot of protective outputs and food freedom is for people with disordered eating and whatever capacity that shows up in their life. And we do applied neurology we do nervous system training, we do emotional processing, and we do somatics to move through that in a six month container together. Cool. I love that. We'll have everything linked down below as well as some of your social sites too, if people want to connect with you there. But, um, is there anything else that you would like to leave our listeners with today or any, anything that we might've missed? I just hope that people will take a moment to realize that their body and their nervous system is not working against them. It's trying to keep you safe and that it can feel really frustrating, really disheartening and and kind of hopeless at times. But that if you can understand that you have this really intelligent, well-designed operating system and it is always changing and it's always changing in response to the stimulus that you give it, you have agency in the direction that it changes and how it changes and how your life then looks as a result of that. And so healing is possible and change is possible at a very deep level. You just need the right tools. Mm. And mic drop. (laughs) (laughs) Beautiful way to end us. Thank you, Elizabeth. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, Thank you guys. Me too. As a fellow nervous system nerd and all the things, this has just been such an affirming conversation. I feel like the universe meant for us to connect because, you know, sometimes you do things that are different, both with yourself and with your clients. And you wonder because it's different than the mainstream and people are getting results. So, you know, it's working, you keep doing it. But how many times, if ever, has, for example, your doctor told you to do nervous system work or just the people that you normally look to for guidance? And so I think it's really affirming to see others in the space who believe in these healing modalities. So that's just been really nice. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation too. Of course it was wonderful. I'm so glad that we got to talk and, um, and I'm on the opposite end of Christina, just meaning that I've not really dove into any of this stuff and it was just very helpful for me because it's something that I've been like toying around with, but I just haven't like done it. You know, I haven't like thought, like looked into working with a practitioner or like anything like that. And so it was really interesting to hear how much of your story, like connected, um, I connected with, and I was like, all right. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) 